It's time for Krishna Bug. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gradhar Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare All glories to His Divine Grace AC Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada Srila Prabhupada Kijai Founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And we are reading his summary study of the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And this is volume 2, chapter 26. The Brahman Sudam, benedicted by Lord Krishna. <clears throat> the previous chapter, uh, we heard about Sudam Brahman and how he and Krishna were friends when they were in the Gurukul of the spiritual master. And uh, they had many episodes together, one time getting lost in the forest, being stranded all night in pouring rain. and. The spiritual master was very pleased with their determination to try and serve him by gathering firewood, even though they got lost. But uh, he was pleased by their devotion to the spiritual master. So they were friends, Krishna and Sudam, as as children. And now uh, Krishna has assumed his position at Kshatriya and with all opulence and palaces and he's he's the king of Dorga with the um, I don't know if he's the king or not yeah he has queen so he's king yes of course and um, and uh, Sudam is a Brahmin very very austere and renounced not at all interested in anything material. And he's so renounced that he and his wife don't even have hardly anything to eat. He's very, very thin and emaciated and because he makes no effort or endeavor to try it for economic development. He's absorbed in uh, tran transcendental uh, life, spiritual life beyond the material world. But his wife uh, was telling him, look, Krishna is your friend. Krishna is very opulent. It's nothing for Krishna to give you a little something. And you're, he's your friend. You should approach Krishna, and Krishna will help you. So his wife was pushing like this, and so he went to see Krishna, although he wasn't even thinking of asking for anything. He just wanted to see Krishna, his old friend. And Krishna received him very, very wonderfully. Um, as befitting a, a very uh, elevated guest in the palace, even though his appearance was very shabby and uh, because uh, of all his austerities, his clothes were torn and he looked very emaciated and thin. And everyone was surprised to see Krishna, who's so opulent, receiving, actually embracing Sudam and washing Sudam's feet and taking the water from Sudam Brahmins, washing the feet and putting it on his own head. And it was, uh, everyone, all the royalty surrounding him were totally amazed. So now uh, they're there together in the palace of Rukmini, Krishna and Rukmini. So this is where we begin chapter 26. Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, 
the super soul of all living entities, knows very well everyone's heart. He is especially inclined to Brahman devotees. Lord Krishna is also called Brahmanya Deva, which means he is worshipped by the Brahmins. Therefore, it's understood that a devotee who is fully surrendered unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead has already acquired the position of a Brahmin. Without becoming a Brahmin, one cannot approach the Supreme Brahman, Lord Krishna. Krishna is especially concerned with vanquishing the distress of his devotees, and he is the only shelter of pure devotees. Lord Krishna was engaged for a long time in talking with Sudam Vipra about their past association. Then, just to enjoy the company of an old friend, Lord Krishna began to smile and asked, My dear friend, what have you brought for me? Has your wife given you some nice eatable for me? While he was addressing his friend, Lord Krishna was looking upon him and smiling with great love. He continued, My dear friend, you must have brought some presentation for me from your home. Lord Krishna knew that Sudaram was hesitating to present him the paltry chipped rice, which was actually unfit for his eating. In understanding the mind of Sudam Vipra, the Lord said, My dear friend, certainly I am not in need of anything, but if my devotee gives me something as an offering of love, even though it may be very insignificant, I accept it with great pleasure. On the other hand, if a person is not a devotee, even if he may offer me very valuable things, I do not like to accept them. I actually accept only things which are offered to me in devotion and love. Otherwise, however valuable the thing may be, I do not accept it. If my pure devotee offers me even the most insignificant things, a little flower, a piece of a leaf, a little water, but saturates the offering in devotional love, then I not only gladly accept such an offering, but I eat it with great pleasure. Lord Krishna assured Sudam Vipan that he would be very glad to accept the chip rice which had been brought from home. Yet out of great shyness, Sudam Vipra hesitated to present it to the Lord. He was thinking, how can I offer such insignificant things to Krishna? And he simply bowed his head. Lord Krishna, the super soul, knows everything in everyone's heart. He knows everyone's determination and everyone's want. He knew, therefore, the reason for Sudam Vipra coming to him. He knew that driven by extreme poverty, he'd come there at the request of his wife. Thinking of Sudam as his very dear class friend, he knew Sudam's love for him as a friend was never tainted by any desire for material benefit. Krishna thought, Sudam has not come asking anything from me, but being obliged by the request of his wife, he's come to see me just to please her. Lord Krishna therefore decided that he would give more material opulence to Sudam Vipra than could be imagined even by the King of Heaven. He then snatched the bundle of chip rice was hanging on the shoulder of the poor Brahmin, packed in one corner of his wrapper, and said, What is this? My dear friend, you brought me rice, palatable chipped rice. He encouraged Sudam Vipra, saying, I consider that this quantity of chipped rice will not only satisfy me, but will satisfy the whole creation. It is understood from the statement that Krishna being the original source of everything, is the root of the entire creation. As watering the root of a tree immediately distributes water to every part of the tree, so an offering made to Krishna or any action for Krishna is to be considered the highest welfare work for everyone because the benefit of such an offering is distributed throughout the creation. Love for Krishna becomes distributed to all living entities. While Lord Krishna was speaking to Siddham Vipra, he ate one morsel of chip rice from his bundle. And when he attempted to eat a second morsel, Rukmini Devi, who is the goddess of fortune herself, checked the Lord by catching hold of his hand. After touching the hand of Krishna, Rukmini said, My dear Lord, this one morsel of chipped rice is sufficient to cause him who offered it to become very opulent in this life 
and to continue his opulence in the next life. My Lord, if you are so kind to your devotee that even this one morsel of chipped rice pleases you very greatly, and your pleasure assures the devotee opulence both in this life and the next. This indicates that when food is offered to Lord Krishna with love and devotion, and he is pleased and accepts it from the devotee, Rukmini Devi, the goddess of fortune, becomes so greatly obliged to the devotee that she has to personally go to the devotee's home to turn it into the most opulent home in the world. If one feeds Narayan sumptuously, the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, automatically becomes a guest in one's house, which means that one's home becomes opulent. The learned Brahmin Sudam passed that night at the house of Lord Krishna, and while he was there, he felt as if he were living in a Vaikuntha planet. Actually, he was living in Vaikuntha, because wherever Lord Krishna, the original Narayan, and Rukmini Devi, the goddess of fortune, live, is non-different from the spiritual planet, Vaikuntha. The learned Brahmin Sudam did not appear to have received anything substantial from Lord Krishna while he was at his place, and yet he did not ask anything from the Lord. The next morning he started for his home, thinking always about his reception by Krishna, and thus he became merged in transcendental bliss. All the way home he was simply remembering the dealings of Lord Krishna. He was feeling very happy to have seen the Lord. The Brahmin began to think as follows. It is most pleasurable to see Lord Krishna, who is most devoted to the, devo to the Brahmins. How great a lover he is of the Brahminical culture. He is the supreme Brahman himself, and yet he reciprocates with the Brahmins. He also respects the Brahmins so much that he embraced to his chest a poor Brahmin like me. Although he never embraces anyone to his chest except the goddess of fortune, how can there be any comparison between me, a poor, sinful Brahmin, and the Supreme Lord Krishna, who is the only shelter of the goddess of fortune? And yet, considering me a Brahmin, he embraced me with heartfelt pleasure in his two transcendental arms. Lord Krishna was so kind to me, he allowed me to sit down on the same bedstead where the goddess of fortune lies down. He considered me to be his real brother. How can I appreciate my obligation to him? When I was tired, Srimati Rukmini Devi, the goddess of fortune, began to fan me, holding the chamara whisk in her own hand. She never considered her exalted position as the first queen of Lord Krishna. I was rendered service by the Supreme Personality of Godhead because of his high regard for Brahmins, and massaging my legs and feeding me with his own hand, he practically worshipped me. Aspiring for elevation to the heavenly planets, or liberation, or all kinds of material opulences, or perfection in mystic yoga powers, everyone throughout the universe worships the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Yet the Lord was so kind to me, he did not give me even a farthing knowing very well I am a poverty-stricken man who, if I got some money, might become puffed up and mad after material opulence, and then forget him. The statement of Brahman Sudam is correct. An ordinary man who is very poor and prays to the Lord for benediction and material opulence, and who somehow or other becomes richer in material opulence, immediately forgets his obligation to the Lord. Therefore, the Lord does not offer opulences to his devotee unless the devotee is thoroughly destitute. Rather, if a neophyte devotee serves the Lord very sincerely and at the same time wants material opulence, the Lord keeps him from obtaining it. Thinking in this way, the learned Brahmin gradually reached his own home. But on reaching there, he saw everything was wonderfully changed. He saw that in place of his cottage, there were big palaces made of valuable stones and jewels, glittering like the sun, moon, and rays of fire. Not only were there big palaces, but at intervals there were beautifully decorated parks in which many women and men were strolling. 
In those parks, there were nice lakes full of lotus flowers and beautiful lilies. There were flocks of multicolored birds. Seeing the wonderful conversion of his native place, the Brahmin began to think to himself, How am I seeing all these changes? Does this place belong to me or to someone else? It's the same place where I used to live. And how is it so wonderfully changed? While the learned Brahmin was considering this, a group of beautiful men and women with features resembling those of demigods, accompanied by musical chanters, approached to welcome him. All were singing auspicious songs. The wife of the Brahmin became very glad on hearing the tidings of her husband's arrival, and with great haste she also came out of the palace. The Brahmin's wife appeared so beautiful that it seemed as if the goddess of fortune herself had come to receive him. As soon as she saw her husband present before her, tears of joy began to fall from her eyes, and her voice became so choked up she could not even address her husband. <clears throat> she simply closed her eyes in ecstasy. But with great love and affection, she bowed down before her husband, and within herself she thought of embracing him. She was fully decorated with a gold necklace and ornaments, and while standing among the maid servants, she appeared like the wife of a demigod just alighting from an airplane. The Brahmin was surprised to see his wife so beautiful, and in great affection and without saying a word, he entered the palace with his wife. When the Brahmin entered his personal apartment in the palace, he saw that it was not an apartment, but the residence of the King of Heaven. The palace was surrounded by many columns of jewels. The couches and bedsteads were made of ivory, bedecked with gold and jewels, and the bedding was as white as the foam of milk and as soft as a lotus flower. There were many whisks hanging from golden rods, and many golden thrones were sitting cushions as soft as the lotus flower. In various places there were velvet and silken canopies with laces of pearls hanging all around. The structure of the building was standing on first-class transparent marble with engravings made of emerald stones. All the women in the palace were carrying lamps made of valuable jewels. The flames and the jewels combined to produce a wonderfully brilliant light. When the Brahmin saw his position suddenly change to one of opulence, and when he could not determine the cause for such a change, he began to consider very, consider very gravely how it had happened. He began to think, From the beginning of my life, I've been extremely poverty-stricken. So what could be the cause of such great and sudden opulence? I do not find any cause other than the all-merciful glance of my friend Lord Krishna, the chief of the outer dynasty. Certainly these are gifts of Lord Krishna's causeless mercy. The Lord is self-sufficient, the husband of the goddess of fortune, and thus he's always full with six opulences. He can understand the mind of his devotee, and he sumptuously fulfills the devotee's desires. All these are acts of my friend Lord Krishna. The beautiful, dark friend Krishna is far more liberal than the cloud which can fill up the great ocean with water. Without disturbing the cultivator with rain during the day, the cloud brings liberal rain at night just to satisfy him. And yet, when the cultivator wakes up in the morning, he considers it has not rained enough. Similarly, the Lord fulfills the desire of everyone according to his position. And yet one who is not in Krishna consciousness considers all the gifts of the Lord to be less than his desire. On the other hand, when the Lord receives a little thing in love and affection from his devotee, he considers it a great and valuable gift. The vivid example is myself. I simply offered him a morsel of chipped rice, and in exchange he's given me opulences greater than the opulence of the King of Heaven. What the devotee actually offers the Lord is not needed by the Lord. He's self-sufficient. If the devotee offers something to the Lord, it acts for his own interest because whatever devotee offers, the Lord comes back in a quantity a million times greater than what was offered. One does not become a loser by giving to the Lord. He becomes a gainer by millions of times. 
The Brahmin, feeling great obligation to Krishna, thought, I pray to have the friendship of Lord Krishna and to engage in his service and to surrender fully unto him in love and affection, life after life. I do not want any opulence. I only desire not to forget his service. I simply wish to be associated with his pure devotees. May my mind and activities be always engaged in his service. The unborn Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna knows that many great personalities have fallen from their positions because of extravagant opulence. Therefore, even when his devotee asks for some opulence from him, the Lord sometimes does not give it. He's very cautious about his devotees because a devotee is in, Im in an immature position of devotional service may, if offered great opulence, fall from his position due to being in the material world. The Lord does not offer opulence to him. This is another manifestation of the causeless mercy of the Lord upon his devotee. His first interest is the devotee may not fall. He is actually like a well-wishing father who does not give much wealth into the hand of his immature son, but who, when the son is grown up, knows how to spend money, gives him the whole treasury house. The learned Brahmin thus concluded that whatever opulences he had received from the Lord should not be used for his extravagant sense gratification, but for the service of the Lord. The Brahmin accepted his newly acquired opulence, but he did so in the spirit of renunciation, unattached to sense gratification. And thus he lived very peacefully with his wife, enjoying all the facilities of opulence as prasadam of the Lord. <clears throat> he enjoyed varieties of foodstuff by offering it to the Lord and then taking it as prasadam. Similarly, if by the grace of the Lord we get such opulences as material wealth, fame, power, education, beauty, it's our duty to consider that they are all gifts of the Lord and must be used for his service, not for our sense gratification. The Lerman Brahmin remained in that position, and instead of deteriorating due to great opulence, his love and affection for Lord Krishna increased day after day. Material opulence can be the cause of degradation and also the cause of elevation, according to the purposes for which it's used. If opulence is used for sense gratification, it's the cause of degradation. And if it's used for the service of the Lord, it is the cause of elevation. It's evident from Lord Krishna's dealings with Sudam Vipra that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is very, very pleased with a person who possessed of Brahminical qualities. A qualified Brahmin like Sudam Vipra is naturally a devotee of Lord Krishna, and therefore it's said, Brahmano Vaishnava, a Brahmin is a Vaishnava. Or sometimes it is said, Brahmana Pandita, Pandita means a highly learned person. A Brahmin cannot be foolish or uneducated. Therefore, there are two divisions of Brahmins, namely Vaishnavas and Pandits. Those who are simply learned are Pandits, but not yet devotees of the Lord, or Vaishnavas. Lord Krishna is not especially pleased with them. Simply the qualification of being a learned Brahmin is not sufficient to attract the Supreme Personality of Godhead. A Brahmin must not only be well qualified according to the requirements stated in scriptures such as Srimad Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, but at the same time, he must be a devotee of Lord Krishna. The vivid example is Sudam Vipra. He was a qualified Brahmin, unattached to all sorts of material sense enjoyment, and at the same time, a great devotee of Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna, the enjoyer of all sacrifices and penances, is very fond of a Brahmin like Sudam Vipra, and we have seen by the actual behavior of Lord Krishna how much he adores such a Brahmin. Therefore, the ideal stage of human perfection is to become a Brahmin, Vaishnava, like Sudam Vipra. Sudam Vipra realized that although Lord Krishna is unconquerable, he nevertheless agrees to be conquered by his devotees. 
He realized how kind Lord Krishna was to him, and he was always in trance, constantly thinking of Krishna. By such constant association with Lord Krishna, whatever darkness of material contamination was remaining within his heart was completely cleared away, and very shortly he was transferred to the spiritual kingdom, which is the goal of all saintly persons in the perfectional stage of life. Sukadeva Goswami has stated that all persons who hear this history of Sudam Vipra and Lord Krishna will know how affectionate Lord Krishna is to the Brahmin devotees like Sudam. Therefore, anyone who hears this history gradually becomes as qualified as Sudam Vipra, and he is thus transferred to the spiritual kingdom of Lord Krishna. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the second volume, 26th chapter of Krishna, the Brahmin Sudam benedicted by Lord Krishna.